I was driving down here. And it occurred to me that this, our meeting today almost never happened. And to be specific about that, I go back almost 20 years. And I remember having this discussion with my dad. I said, Dad, I'm fortunate enough, you know, I've studied my uh, tail off in high school. I've got good grades. I've got some choice on where I'm going to go to school. And uh, my plan was anywhere but the Midwest. I born and grew up in a super small town over on the west side of the state. And I remember having this discussion with my dad. I said, you know, I go anywhere I want. I already had the bags packed. I was ready to head out to the east coast and see the world. And I'm having this very animated discussion with my dad. And he's just stoic. And he's letting me go on and on and on. And finally, I finish. And I said, isn't this exciting? And he said, well, he said, Jason, I have some good news. And I have some bad news for you. I said, well, let's start with the good news. And he said, your mother and I both feel that education is the most important gift you can give your children. And uh, because of that, I am happy to tell you we have saved some money and are willing to give you the gift of a college education. And I was like, yes. <laughs> East Coast, here I come. And I almost forgot to say, well, what's the bad news? And I said, well, Dad, what's the bad news? He said, well, the bad news, I don't know if you'll view it as bad news, but the news is we had planned on you going to an in-state university. And so we have uh, graciously put away about 15, 12 or $15,000 for your four-year education at the University of Michigan. So I am a little older. I remember back in the day when it was, I think tuition was 900 bucks or 1,100 bucks and room and board was like 900 bucks. And so when you put it all together, it was about five grand a year. And uh, my dad said, but actually here might be the silver lining for you. He said, you know what? I'll give you the $5,000 a year and you can apply it to one of these universities on the East Coast that at the time was like 15 or 20 grand a year. So I said, boy, Michigan sounds like a great choice. <laughs> and, uh, and so here, here I ended up at the University of Michigan and I learned a really important lesson. You do not need to learn, leave the state of Michigan to see the world because it's all right here in Ann Arbor. And I, have, I, I didn't necessarily grow up a Wolverine fan. I've got Iowa people in my background and all kinds of other universities. But after my stay here at the university, I have definitely evolved into one of those alumni that is, is uh, very passionate about our community, about our academics, about our athletics. And it's part of the reason why I wanted to come back and meet all of you today. And uh, the University of Michigan was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I assume it will be the same for you guys as, uh, as you navigate Ann Arbor. So I thought I'd, I'd have prepared remarks around a couple of different areas. And uh, as Tom said, feel free to interrupt me. I'm not here to practice my presentation skills. I'm here to share some information with you and hopefully uh, have a dialogue. But I'll talk a little bit about my path from Ann Arbor to becoming the CEO of a high growth software company. Um, it is frankly probably one of the more traditional paths. It is not the path that you see in the news and that movies are written about and books and all the fame and fortune comes with. It's been a 20 year career of working hard and continuing to make move my way up. I was not smart enough to invent something in my dorm room here at Michigan and go on to incredible fame and fortune. But it's an alternate path, and so you can hopefully take away from that. I'll share a little bit about our company, Plex Systems. Um, we are actually headquartered in Troy. Um, I made the mistake, I guess. Well, in hindsight, it doesn't feel like a mistake. But I made the move 20 years ago to move out of the Midwest to uh, Silicon Valley to start a career in software. And now here I am back running a company that is headquartered in the great state of Michigan and is very much like a Silicon Valley company, but without the high housing prices and all the crap that comes with living in California. So I'll tell you a little bit about our company because we're local, we're hiring, we're growing. It's an awesome place to work. And then the last thing I'll share with you are, I think it's like seven or eight just kind of anecdotes. I was recently interviewed for a book. I'm first time CEO at Plex. I was recently interviewed for a book, and the whole theory of the book or the whole premise of the book or what are some of the things you've learned as an entrepreneur at a growing company that you wish you would have known or things that you've learned. And so I'll share those with you. It's kind of a wide range of things, so hopefully you, know, you pick up maybe one or two things or it provokes a little bit of, uh, of thought. So my background, I, as I reflected on this, I've actually been a, an entrepreneur since the ripe old age of 10 years old. And I remember uh, one summer wanting to have a little walking around money as a 10-year-old. And I, as I said, I grew up in a small resort town in the west side of Michigan, a little town called Spring Lake, if any of you are familiar with that side of the state. And one thing that, all right, well, 
I said, you know, I'm going to look around in the summer everywhere. You know, there's guys cutting grass, but I said, I'm going to start a boat cleaning business. And I convinced my mom to take me down to the local marinas, and she drove me around and dropped me off, and I'd made up this nice collateral. Back in the day, it was just paper, nothing too fancy, and walked up and down the docks as a 10-year-old pitching my services. And uh, I looked back on it, and it was just a great experience, you know, to sell yourself and your services and actually think about how to put together services and, frankly, sell them to a guy who's now in, you know, my age, my shoes. And I have to say, I think probably a lot of them just felt pity for this little 10-year-old who was, uh, you know, probably figured the parents had sent him out on hard labor. And uh, I ended up, that was what I did. I ran a boat cleaning business up until I came to, actually until I graduated from University of Michigan. I ended up having people working for me, and it was kind of a, a big business. But at the end of the day, um, it was a lot of manual labor and not a lot of upside in the boat cleaning business. It's about a three-month season in Michigan, so and I needed to, to find some other, other things. So I, as I said, ended up at Ann Arbor. I told you my story of how I got here, one of the best decisions of my life. Um, when I graduated, I remember having conversations with my counselors, and uh, I had no freaking idea what I wanted to do. I had no idea. And so I share that with you because if you feel that way, if you're still an undergrad, freshman, upperclassman, it's okay. It is absolutely okay. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And uh, my counselor said, just start interviewing. Just start meeting some of these companies that are coming in, and, and you'll figure it out. So I ended up going to Price Waterhouse um, back when it was called Price Waterhouse. It's changed a little bit over the years. And I did consulting, and it was awesome. It was an awesome place to start my career because, again, they train you really well, real-life experiences about how to manage teams, train you in new technology. You get to travel all over the world, uh, sell your services, work with exciting companies. So it was, a, it was a great experience, but a lot of people eventually are like, gosh, getting on a plane every, every week isn't quite the rock star lifestyle that it sounds like. And they eventually get to the point where they want to make a career change. And so I was at Pricewaterhouse. I was doing PeopleSoft work, which at the time was uh, an ERP company, an enterprise resource planning company that was brand new, cutting edge. It was client server software, and it was the wave of the future. And I was doing those implementations, uh, again, first project um, out of college at Price Waterhouse, and I got recruited away to, to go to PeopleSoft. And this was once again where I just loved the entrepreneurial lifestyle. When I joined the company, we were super small. I was brought on board uh, to help get our Western region started up. And I got to do everything. I mean, I literally mean everything from, you know, stocking the coffee machine to helping sell services, helping some of our largest customers implement PeopleSoft software. Again, a, a high dose of travel, um, but I absolutely loved it. It was just awesome as a, a young kid getting this exposure and, and just seeing all these different businesses and learning from them. I was there for 10 years. I literally did everything from managed projects to running the West Region to running our internal IT group at, uh, at PeopleSoft. So it was a phenomenal experience. For me, it was almost like getting an MBA, but in the real world, um, just a kind of a different flavor of it. Loved working there, and uh, for those of you who uh, maybe are a little older or followed the enterprise software industry, we were acquired by a company called Oracle, which I'm sure almost everyone in here has heard of. And still to this day, the acquisition of PeopleSoft by Oracle is the only hostile takeover in the history of software. And the reason why hostile takeovers don't happen is they're hostile and the people leave. And at the end of the day, a software company, its biggest asset is are its people. And so Larry Ellison, though, he had his way with us, and lo and behold, at the end of the day, he got a lot of revenue and a lot of customers, but a lot of us left. And uh, so I ended up leaving, and again, you can kind of see some of the pattern here. I wanted to go back to a smaller company and really be involved in a company where I could both build, but also every one of my career changes I've made, I've also wanted to really learn something. I wanted there to be something that really pushed me out of my comfort zone, something I didn't know how to do in that job. And as I said, we were at PeopleSoft and then Oracle. We were client server, so very old technology now. Um, but I had a chance to go work with some of my former Taleo, uh, PeopleSoft colleagues at a company called Taleo, which was one of the very first companies to pioneer the software as a service model and running software in the cloud for customers, which today seems like, I mean, how else would you do it, right? But back when I joined Taleo, that in and of itself was huge. And so I knew the type of software we were running, but it was the business model that was, for me, really the challenge and why I went there. 
Uh, the other thing that was interesting, and this is, I would describe it probably as my uh, CEO with training wheels opportunity. I was brought in to actually incubate and start a business inside of Taleo. So as Tom said in the intro, I had full responsibility. We had a product, we had three or four people, we had about a million dollars worth of revenue. And my goal was to grow that business as quickly as I could. And uh, I had the benefit of it was almost like we were inside of an incubator because we were inside of Taleo, which at the time was a bigger company. Uh, but it was a unique opportunity, a unique opportunity to, again, really run something but have that safety net of a, of a bigger company. Uh, there's a pattern here. Once again, Oracle came knocking. This time it, it was friendly. And uh, Oracle bought Taleo as one of the three or four companies that they put together through an acquisition strategy to really start to move uh, their business to the cloud. Um, I didn't last as long this time. I'd, I guess once you go through the door at Oracle and pass out, you kind of go through a little quicker the next time around. Um, so I'll never forget it. I was sitting there in my office one day, you know, with a flat spot on my head from just beating against the wall, and, and uh, the phone rings. And, and uh, I didn't recognize the number, but it was, you know, it was like chat roulette. I was like, all right, I'm gonna pick up and see who this is. And I was a recruiter. And he said, hey, Jason, we're recruiting for a CEO of Plex Systems. Um, this is this great company that's doing super innovative manufacturing software in the cloud. Um, it's got some scale, it's got huge growth potential, new investors from Silicon Valley, and they're looking for a CEO. And I said, this is awesome. This is exactly the next deal I want to do. He's like, one thing I got to tell you, though, it's in Michigan. I was like, oh, well, I don't really have any bias towards Michigan, but I happen to live in California. And I said, no, no, you don't have to relocate. They want a CEO who's actually based in Silicon Valley, who's been at some other companies that have been successful to come in and run this company. And uh, I engaged with the company, and here I am now almost three years later uh, as the CEO. So. Let me tell you a little bit about our company. Again, I think it's good for all of you as, as uh, aspiring entrepreneurs to know who some of the, the companies are locally that are doing pretty interesting things. The next couple of slides I'm sharing with you are actually out of our pitch deck. Um, they're part of a deck that I used about a year ago when we went out and raised uh, $50 million of funding for our, round, our, uh, our B round of funding. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But a little bit more about our company. So we are a in terms of our architecture and our business model, we are as pure as it gets when it comes to software as a service based business model. All of our customers run in the same instance of our application. All of it is run in the cloud. And, uh, and that is, I'd be happy, to, I'll just leave it at this. I'd be happy to answer some questions later because there's a lot of debate right now in our industry about what's real cloud, true cloud, and there's a lot of kind of interesting debate around that. I, I won't bore you with that right now. In terms of what we do, it's a, a full enterprise resource planning product. I mean, that sounds probably to you guys like software that's used to absolutely torture people. But essentially, it's manufacturing software, including financial supply chain, HR, human resources software, and customer management software. The business has some nice scale. We have 450-ish uh, customers. I think we're actually up to 480 now since I put this together. And those customers run our uh, products. It's now up to 1,400 manufacturing facilities. Uh, in 20 countries around the world. Um, we are almost done with 2015. We're gonna be at about $90 million uh, in revenue this year. And in Q4, we hit the $25 million run rate, which is pretty significant. There have not been a lot of cloud companies that have gotten over 100 million in revenue in enterprise software. In fact, I think there's like a dozen. So a lot of these companies, they get bought or they fail to scale, they have hit issues. So we're proud of the fact that we're one of those, those companies that's, that's had a, having a breakout. In terms of our headquarters, as I said, we're up in Troy. We're uh, right off of 75 and, uh, and Crooks. We also have offices, and we have offices actually now all over the place. I happen to be based out of Pleasanton. I travel here all the time. Question? Yes, sir. Are you a public company? No, we're private. We're private. Yeah, we're, we're making investments in the company right now to get our infrastructure to be public grade and uh, you know, hiring certain skill sets and implementing certain systems and controls. We're probably a year, year and a half away internally and then of course it just becomes a question of what's going on in the market. Um, and then as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later. Our investors are two tier one um, investment groups out of Silicon Valley called Francisco Partners and Excel Partners. 
And then we raised a B round of funding uh, about a year and a half ago with T. Rowe Price. And um, T. Rowe Price tends to invest three or four, in three or four companies every year that are private that they think are going to become public. And they start investing in them as private companies to build their position and eventually then buy through an IPO and, and buy and hold over time. In terms of a little bit more about our opportunity, um, if you take a look at our market that we play in, um, the, the largest amount of software spend out there is in financial services. The second largest is in manufacturing. And so our global market that we're playing in is a $30 billion market. And that's pretty significant. I mean, it's, it is arguably one of, if not the largest software markets out there aside from financial services. Um, so it is a very large, app, uh, very large market, and it is also a market that is dominated by what we affectionately refer to as zombie companies. They are last generation legacy technology companies. Um, there's kind of a, a joke in software, it is impossible to kill a software company. Someone's always going to take the code and milk it for a little more money or try and innovate or try and do something with it. And so we affectionately refer to them as zombie companies. So there's a lot of legacy companies in our space that have not made the move to the cloud. And uh, so we like, we like our market size. We like our favorable competitive uh, positioning. The other thing that's interesting about our company is we were founded by five software engineers. And uh, they built a fantastic product, um, great product, and frankly managed to succeed in spite of themselves. They never really hired any salespeople, but they still, the product was that good. It actually did kind of sell itself. Um, so it was a company that achieved some nice scale, um, but as I said, we're now owned by two investment firms out of San Francisco, Bay Area. And their thesis, their investment thesis in the company was, we have this great product that works, that people love. We have this huge market, and it's one of the last markets to move to the cloud. Manufacturers tend to adopt tech, newer technology architectures at a slower rate because they cannot afford to have their technology not work or be down. Uh, because of the penalties and the costs of when your software that's actually running your manufacturing line goes down. So, so the investment thesis was, here we got this great product, a market that's not moved yet. We just need more capital and investment and expertise in the company. And that was why I joined, and it's why a lot of people since I have joined, I think we were about 200 people when I uh, started. And as I said, we're 450 plus now, coming up on 500. That's why people have joined, one of the biggest reasons. As I said, ERP sounds like you know, a weapon of mass destruction. If you're not familiar with it, it sounds like just a device of torture. But ultimately, this is what we do. We are the nervous system that runs a manufacturing plant. Everything from taking customer orders to then ordering the raw material required to fulfill that order to actually receiving all of that raw material, managing the build process on the shop floor through to final product, shipping it to the customer, and accounting for the whole thing. So that's in a nutshell, that's what we do. The thing that's also unique about us, in fact, I was talking ab about this before we got started, since we're a modern open cloud architecture, it's really easy for us to plug into all of the devices, essentially the internet of things that exist on a shop floor. And so aside from just being a lower, modern, lower cost solution, one of the other big differentiators for us is that we can plug into all of those robots and sensors on the shop floor, and in many cases actually control them. Like a lot of the robots on the shop floor, they're actually controlled out of Plex. They're told by Plex what welding routine to run. So we can do that. The other thing that we do is I just read a lot of this data that has never been consumable by humans before because it's such a vast data set. Actually consume that data and, uh, and boil it down so that uh, plant managers can use it to make, make better decisions. So that is Plex. Uh, in terms of uh, our go-to-market, we really have focused historically on selling, frankly, to manufacturing customers here in the Midwest. And so there's a lot of discrete manufacturers in the Midwest. Discrete manufacturers are people who make things where the end product, you can identify the parts in the final assembly. You can see the discrete parts. And we're getting more and more into process manufacturing. And in process manufacturing, it's more about recipes and blending things together. Um, one of our favorite customers and something you all might know a little bit about is Green Flash Beer. So it'd be a great example of one of our process manufacturing customers. We run their beer manufacturing line uh, down in San Diego. And you can get Green Flash, by the way, over at Ashley's. I've, I've tested that out. Or if you're 21. Yeah, only if you're 21. I would not advocate fake IDs. I never had one. Um, 
you know, the thing that's still interesting about our customers is a lot of them, you, you look at these logos up there and you're like, well, maybe I've heard of Meyer and I've heard of Green Flash, but a lot of times our customers are the, you know, the man behind the man, so to speak. They make the product, but it's totally branded differently in the market. And I'll just give you a sense for who some of the customers are. Eagle Picture Technologies, I was just meeting with their CEO today before I came down here. They make batteries. Well, what kind of batteries you say? They make all the batteries that power the International Space Station, all the satellites that are floating around up in space, and they also make all the missile silo batteries for the U.S. Uh, Army, so uh, U.S. military. So pretty important stuff in terms of our national defense and a lot of the uh, intelligence community stuff. Floorcraft, great Michigan story. They're up in Ludington. They make something that maybe your grandmas have used in the past. It's that green foam that people stick floral arrangements in. Great Michigan entrepreneurial story. And uh, they're a Plex customer. And because of their ability to consistently produce and deliver high quality products, they were named the Walmart supplier of the year uh, this past year. A couple more, Robert Shaw, again, another company you probably never heard of. If uh, any of you today used an appliance in your kitchen or took a shower, that, a hot shower actually, Robert Shaw makes all the controllers in North America for appliances uh, and hot water heaters. And then finally, uh, how many, anybody here from the east side of the state? You guys know what bumpy cakes are? I'd never heard of a bumpy cake. I grew up on the west side of the state, never heard of a bumpy cake. Well, one of our customers makes bumpy cakes, uh, Sanders Candy. They are also the largest sea salt caramel producer in the world. And if you fly on Delta Airlines, they hand them out on Delta. So just gives you a flavor for our customers. And it's frankly one of the things I absolutely love about our company. Our customers actually make things that we use every day that make our lives better, that provide convenience to us. It's pretty cool at the end of the day after meeting with customers to actually go home and, uh, and use a product uh, in your life that one of our customers made. So that's the, the quick Plex story. Um, I just want to share a few things with, any questions on that, by the way, before I move on? Yes. I, I wonder if you're going to share this or not, but um, I know we get asked a lot of times by students, um, what's different about doing an innovation inside of a company uh, versus starting a new company? And I, I think it'd be really interesting to hear your perspective on that. Yeah. I actually have a slide that kind of touches on that. Um, ultimately, it gets to your risk tolerance. I think back to my experience at Taleo, where I had a chance to come in and build a new, basically a business inside of a business. The great thing about it is I didn't have to worry about payroll. I didn't have to worry about facilities. I didn't have to worry about going out and hiring a finance team. I had to jockey with our board a little bit for fundraising, but by and large, fundraising wasn't a problem. So as I said earlier, it's like being in an incubator. You get a lot of that kind of core infrastructure that I think a lot of people, when they have the dream of being an entrepreneur, they forget how hard that stuff is, your IT infrastructure. I remember when we opened our, our first office out in California, my office, it was a joke. Our IT infrastructure was just torturing us, just torturing us. The phones didn't work. Collaboration tools didn't work. You know, having problems with the badging and getting in and out of the office. You know, these are all the things that they don't tell you that come with being <laughs> with the glorious life of being an entrepreneur. And so I think you know, there's definitely a convenience factor of doing uh, starting a new business inside of a company, and it's also I think a little lower risk because if you do fail, there's a, a little bit of a dragnet. Yeah, please. It is. It's a, I mean, that is a great question. So I'll give you a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, a lot, so again, we sell to manufacturing companies. And one of the reasons that our customers or our prospects often show up at our door is they don't have a good IT staff in house. And a lot of times, you think about it, manufacturing companies are in somewhat remote rural locations. So it's hard to find good IT staff. And the number one source of hacking of corporate systems is actually the internal threat. And so a lot of our prospects that come to us are, uh, are worried about security, and they know that that is what we do all day, every day. In the acronym SAS, Software as a Service, that's the as a service part. It's our ability to run that application at scale, provide the level of availability, and provide the level of security. So most of our customers will say Plex is the gold standard compared to what, uh, what we're able to do on our own. It is one of the things, though, that keeps me up at night. 
Um, we have a great staff. We invest a lot of money in tooling and expertise. Um, but it is, it is one of those things, especially as you're a growing company, it is one of the things that, uh, that does keep me up at night. Uh, and I especially, I look at some of our customers, like uh, one of our customers is Ceres Distilleries. Again, another brand that you've probably never heard of, but they make Don Q rum and they make uh, whatever the pirate one is. I'm not a rum guy. Uh, the pirate with the, uh, the Captain Morgan Spice rum. And so they make that using our product and so kind of their equivalent of Coke. Coke's recipe, their equivalent for Don Q rum, is stored in our product. So, you know, we have to have the highest level of security. Yeah. Awesome question. So, um, I'll give you a couple, couple anecdotes on that. So, we're a full Microsoft stack. And uh, I have to be honest, this is a little bit of my bias of having kind of grown up in Silicon Valley. Nobody in Silicon Valley would start a, a company and build on Microsoft. They would all go Linux, open source, you know, maybe you spend some money on Oracle for the database. Um, and when I joined the company, I, it was a little bit of a tech bias that I, I, I actually am not sure I ever got over. I just came to the conclusion this is a good opportunity, nothing's perfect, and Microsoft is a fact of life at Plex. In the th almost three years I've been here now, Microsoft has made huge strides in their technology. And I think the changing of the guard when Balmer left and Satya came in and is really focused on cloud infrastructure and providing infrastructure and platform as a service now, that concern has completely gone away. And uh, I think Microsoft still has a ways to go in terms of scalability and features to catch up with Amazon and Google and, and some of the other platforms that are out there, Salesforce, if you want to also throw them in. But they are closing the gap very quickly. And they are, su they are super serious about this market. So, so just from a platform perspective, that's what we're built on. It went from being kind of a eh, to now I'm actually pretty happy with it. Um, but the other thing that is important to point out about us, uh, our release cycle and how we release innovation, we actually do releases every day. So, you know, old on-premise software updates maybe once a year, more likely twice a year that nobody ever used. Cloud comes along, people start doing one release a year and everyone gets upgraded at the same time and maybe two releases a year. And we've always been innovation every day. And people say, that's crazy, how do you do that? Or why do you do that actually? And if you look at one of our biggest constituents, it's the auto industry. And I'll give you a real life example today. I was talking to a customer and they said, Jason, one of our biggest contracts is Daimler Chrysler. And they just pushed down this change in the supply chain about how they want labels printed and parts packaged on a pallet. And the, 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 all the labels come out of Plex, all the instructions to the workers on the shop floor about how to package it and put it on the truck in Plex. And so we had to make some configuration changes for that customer literally on the fly. Otherwise they shut down Daimler Chrysler's line and they go out of business. So we've always had to be very agile and nimble in reacting to the market that we serve. And so we're, we actually look more like a consumer company when it comes to releases than an enterprise software company. Luckily, a lot of it's standards based. A lot of it's standards based. And because all of our customers are on the same release, on the same platform, a lot of the connectors, it's build once, use 450 times. As opposed to the old world where everyone was running their own version of something and you had to have all these bespoke, you know, connectors in the cloud world, that, there are other problems, but that problem goes away because again, everyone's on the same release and so it's easier to keep the infrastructure harmonized and working, but you know, it's standards based. Is it perfect? Do things break? They do, but it's not as hard as it used to be because of the, again, that whole notion of standards and everyone being on the same version. Yeah. Oh, that's an awesome question. So every, the, every company I've ever worked at has had just yeah, well, there's nothing I haven't said before. 
if you dig out there, I'm quoted it with some pretty uh, inflammatory quotes. Um, Oracle is a 150,000 person company. They've been wildly successful. You can't argue with that. But it's like working for the, a government. I mean, it's a big bureaucracy and it's, they manage to innovate and do good things somewhat in spite of themselves, but I just like a faster pace. I like, be, I like a faster pace of play. I like to be able to leave even as the CEO now of a company at the end of the day and be able to look back and say, I made a difference in something today. And you know, some of these bigger companies, not to pick on Oracle, but just more broadly speaking, I mean, it's like trying to push a, uh, an iceberg down a channel. I mean, it's just, they move at a glacial pace. And I think that's why if you look back every kind of 20, 30 years, there's a new set of horsemen that are at the lead in technology. I think some, some of these companies, they just get too big, can't move quickly enough. So it's pace of play, it's culture, you know, it's, it's, it, those are really the two biggest things. Yeah. If you release every day, how do you test that so you know you're not, not going to crash or the bugs are not going to miss the pickup? Two things. So um, one thing is a general thing and one is, is kind of an interesting nuance to, to cloud companies. So we a actually have a test team that builds a lot of automation uh, scripts that we run over all the core product, part of the product that's used by most customers. So before something gets deployed, there's a full set of regression tests that run against the software. Uh, the other thing is we have actually built a lot of custom tooling to make sure that uh, referential integrity is sound in different tables and you know, certain things that we know are gonna hit the database hard or like making sure things are indexed properly. So there's actually a whole council that we have built that based on our product and our environment runs a whole other set of audits before something deploys to production and we call it the deployer. We very innovative coming up with the name. Um, and even at my last company at Taleo, same thing. We'd written our own version of the deployer. I know a bunch of people over at Salesforce, they have their own version. I've often thought this might be an interesting area of innovation, a, you know, more of a, a, a council or a system that helps manage the deployments to production. Now there's some out there certainly that do this, but every big cloud environment is different and has its different nuances and almost every customer I've met has written their own custom tooling for that. Yeah, red sweater. We do, so we're actually working on that right now. I mean, that's one of our biggest, you know, the questions that were asked earlier about how do you not break things. Um, one of the things that we have worked most on in the last year, almost two years now, is working on our uh, integration framework. It's called Plex Connect. And first and foremost, we've been trying to develop a lot of the most common connectors that people need to plug into, you know, certain presses and robots and CNC machines that you're gonna see on a shop floor. But the other thing that we've done is really tried to abstract away some of the complexity of our product and how you actually get data in and out of it and just expose that in, in uh, APIs so that uh, the developer community can start to build on top of it. Now it's not as mature as like a Salesforce is at this point in their evolution, but directionally it's where we're going. I think any cloud software, especially because you can't customize it, you have to offer those hooks, those extensions uh, for the developer community to, to be able to extend the app. Yeah. All right, well, I'll take one more in the back. I love the questions. So, um, how many of your customers know ahead of time that they want or need your product? Does it differ at all between people that Yeah, good question. So that's, that, the question is, you know, how do our customers come to us? How do they know they need it? That is one thing that is still, in my experience, in the cloud, the same as it was selling on-premise software. It's still a long sales process. It takes about a year. It's demo intensive. People want to see the application. They want to see that it's going to fix whatever the issue they have uh, is. So, uh, you know, it's still a pretty involved year-ish long sales process. It's very demo heavy. All right, I'm going to fly through these next few. So we've got more time for questions. Ask me questions on any one of these. A lot of people say, and this came out in this book interview, you know, you're a CEO, what the hell do you guys do all day? What's like, when you get up, what do you think about? For me, the first thing is my team and the talent in the company. I think you're, when you are asked to be a CEO, the most important part of the mission that's being handed to you is picking your team. 
And I have been successful in my career at an early age because I, was all, I always had a good eye for talent and, a, and felt uh, was always good at connecting with people and finding the right chemistry in a team. And chemistry is important as well. I've, I've been in a lot of companies where hiring managers just go out and try and hire the most pedigreed or perceived smartest person in the room. And uh, you get a bunch of smartest people in the room. If you guys have ever encountered that, it can sometimes be a little caustic. And so I have been successful over my career, not just being able to find smart people, but also hiring people that have good chemistry in working together. And I grew up, you're never supposed to use sports analogies in a presentation, so I'm about to break a rule. But I grew up uh, here in the Midwest when the Bulls first got Michael Jordan out of North Carolina. Best player in the NBA, worst team. And it was only after Phil Jackson, the coach, surrounded Michael Jordan with the right chemistry and the right complementary roles that they go on to start beating up on the Pistons and, uh, and win many NBA titles. So again, budding entrepreneurs thinking of starting a company, smart people is part of it, but the chemistry and the culture of how your teams work together equally as important. Uh, one other thing I would also mention, um, as a CEO, I spend probably 20% of my time, it, it actually might be a little higher right now, recruiting. I mean, I am always meeting people in my network, people who are suggesting that you should meet this person, they're super smart, building my network for that day when I need to replace someone or I have some turnover, someone leaves for another opportunity. So I actually spend a good portion of my time, it's probably a little higher than 20% right now because I'm hiring a couple board members and uh, two executive team members. Second part is setting corporate strategy or your business strategy, right? I mean, this sounds pretty obvious, but you know, it's one of the things that I didn't realize that even after going to the great University of Michigan and even working at PeopleSoft and, and Pricewaterhouse, I didn't know how to craft a business plan strategy. I didn't know how to drive a data-driven plan about what's our market, who are the customers we're targeting, what is that customer's issue that we're gonna solve, why are we different than the 80, 80 other software companies out there that are trying to solve this exact same problem. And I just, I, I had to go through it a couple times. It's like anything in life where it is, there is a process and there is somewhat of a science to it and you just have to learn it. And you know, going back to my first couple slides, I didn't know how to do this and I have hired, I have my last two roles, last two companies, the CEO in Training Wheels role and now here at Plex, I actually have a really smart guy who uh, was a former McKinsey consultant and does this stuff in his sleep. And again, the market analysis, figuring out what's important to the customer, the competitive landscape, how you're gonna position, how you're gonna sell. A lot of entrepreneurs aren't good at this. And I see this all the time. When I meet with entrepreneurs and a couple companies that I've been mentoring in California, and you ask them for these basic questions, I mean, it's like a house of cards. They kind of crumble and the answers are more emotional and anecdotal than they are really rooted in data and, and well thought out. So. Strategy, a couple on fundraising. This is also always one that people ask a lot about. Um, so you got a great team, you got a great business plan, now you need some money to pay the people and, and fund the plan. I was having a conversation the other day with a friend of mine who runs a payment processing company and they were raising a round of money. And uh, he said, Jason, I got a, a meeting with Andreessen Horowitz, which is right now probably one of the hottest venture capital firms in the valley right now. He was so psyched. He's like, I got a, a meeting with, with Andreessen Horowitz. I'm going down there tomorrow. The pitch is rock solid. We're going to kill it. Saw him like two or three weeks later. And I said, so how did it go? He said, it was a disaster. I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, it wasn't a disaster. It was a waste of time. I said, what do you mean? And he said, they took the meeting more to learn about the payments processing industry. And at the end of the meeting, they said, hey, great pitch, but we just don't know enough about the payment processing industry to invest in your business. And so they were almost using him as their way to get educated. And this is common. A lot of, if you look at a lot of the different uh, top tier venture firms, they usually have three or four themes that they're investing in. It could be payment processing, it could be IOT, it could be um, enterprise software, it could be cloud, it could be mobile, it could be social. Doing a little diligence and really understanding what those firms are uh, interested in will save you as an entrepreneur uh, the, the, the time and challenge of educating these guys on, on what, what the market really is. So save yourself a little time, do some diligence on the investors. The other thing that I have seen very common in Silicon Valley is or just in the tech community, let's forget about Silicon Valley for a minute, there is definitely a pecking order 
in the investment community. And right now there's probably four or five investors in Silicon Valley that are, are, are in tech. Andreessen Horowitz, uh, Benchmark, Excel, Kleiner Perkins, that are top tier firms that are just picking winners. And you might say, well, what does it matter? Isn't, isn't, isn't a dollar the same, whether it's from Battery Ventures or Benchmark? They both begin with a B, the dollar's green. And this is, this is one thing I've learned at Plex. So we're fortunate enough to have Excel Partners as one of our investors. And having a top tier investor plays dividends down the road. As I've gone out and tried to hire an, a very experienced executive team, one of the first things they ask me is, who are your investors? Oh, Excel? Wow, okay, if Excel thought this company was interested, I'm interested. Then th th that was a, a common experience I had. The other one that was fascinating to me is when we went out to raise our second round of funding with T. Rowe Price, the $50 million uh, round B, I was expecting this to just be a gauntlet of trying to get someone, pry $50 million out of someone's hands. It took us two hours. My CFO and I flew to Baltimore went into this enormous conference room. There were probably 100 people in this long conference room. I did our pitch. It was about an hour. They asked questions for an hour. I walked out, and I said to the guy who led the meeting from the T-Row side, so what's next? And he's like, oh, no, we're good. We're good. We just need to see some contracts and do some legal due diligence. And I said, and anyway, I'm like, too, too overanxious. I said, that's it? And he said, yeah. He said, if Excel has done their diligence and Francisco Partners has done their diligence, that's good enough for them. So. You know, some of these top tier venture firms, they're wedges, and a lot of the money that comes in in the later rounds will follow that wedge, and talent will follow the wedge. So I've seen investors, or excuse me, I've seen entrepreneurs that have taken less favorable term sheets to get a better VC in, and said down the line, I'm glad I gave up a little more of my company, because it made it easier to raise money at a better valuation down the road. I've hired better talent, et cetera, et cetera. Leverage your network especially the University of Michigan. The great thing about Michigan alums, one, there's a lot of them, and two, they're super passionate about helping, helping uh, entrepreneurs that are coming out of the university. I literally probably field three or four calls a day of people who found me on LinkedIn, saw what companies I've been involved with and have reached out and say, hey, we just would love an introduction to someone you know, we'd love to kind of run our idea by you. So your journey to being a part of, of the University of Michigan alumni uh, network is actually the most important decision you've made so far in your career. So don't, don't forget that. Uh, this question that kind of comes back to something I answered earlier, um, I, I would consider my own career again as kind of a 20-year long um, uh, effort that really started in an academy company. Pricewaterhouse and PeopleSoft, where I just learned great things about how to build a business, how to lead people, how to manage a P&L, financials, all these basic things. Um, so PeopleSoft was my academy company. There's some great ones here in Ann Arbor. Google's got a big campus here. Facebook has a great campus here. These are companies that actually are willing to incubate businesses inside the bigger business. So this is, uh, you know, a lot of people, again, they want to be Mark Zuckerberg. They want to go start the next Facebook. That is one path, but it is the lower probability path to success. And actually going to work at one of these bigger companies, even Oracle for that matter, um, you know, you learn a lot of good things. And even more importantly, at some of these companies, I think you learn bad habits that you don't want to take into your own company someday. So don't, don't be afraid to work for what I would characterize as an academy, a company, academy company. Last couple things here. Um, there are tons of great entrepreneur organizations out there. I mean, there's a very robust community here, obviously, at the University of Michigan. You guys are all engaged with it. Don't let that stop when you leave school. Um, I'm a member of Young, Young Presidents Organization, essentially a group of CEOs that are under 45 that run all kinds of different companies. It's a birds of a feather group. And I, I'll look back on all the things I've done in my career, more from a networking and, and support kind of infrastructure. This, for me, has been one of the, the, the best decisions I've made. So don't, don't leave these kind of organizations behind or think they were only uh, a, college, a college phenomenon. I think this is my last thing here. Unless you are, again, Mark Zuckerberg and found the next Facebook, your career is going to be an ultra marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not a marathon. It is an ultra marathon. And in my own experience as a CEO now and just knowing a lot of CEOs and knowing a lot of software executives, 
the most successful ones have a balanced life. They are into their families or whatever family is for you. They give back to their communities. They're into their business and they have some stress outlet. For me, it's CrossFit. In fact, I'm gonna go to CrossFit Tree Town when I'm done here tonight. But some fitness outlet or some outlet that allows you to blow off, <laughs> blow off steam. And uh, I'll give you an anecdote on this one. I was, this weekend I had a, a friend of mine who's on a board call me and he was considering a friend of mine to be a CEO at one of his companies. And I knew this as I answered the call and I was thinking he's gonna ask me all these questions about like interview type questions. He asked me two questions. He said, is this guy the kind of guy that you would wanna get stuck with in an airport overnight and have to spend the night with? And the second question he asked me is he said, what's this guy's relationship with his family? And so he was just looking for balance in, in this guy to make sure he wasn't just gonna come into this company and just be this maniacal slave driver that drives his entire management team and company crazy. So balance is important in life. It doesn't mean don't work hard, but again, it's a series of, uh, of, of sprints that I guess make up the ultra marathon.